<laughs> okay, um, so I'll, I'll skip the title because it's not a particularly good one. Um, and I'll try to actually start by uh, um, telling you a little bit about what I would try to, what I want to accomplish. I'm not, I'm not sure that I'll realize that, but I, this is not a talk where I'm going to tell you that technology is not important, right? And, and I think we've heard, and we will hear many speakers that will argue that we still need a lot of technology innovation. Uh, uh, and I fully subscribe to that position. Um, what I want to actually convey is that we are now operating in an environment where technology by itself is not necessarily sufficient. And in particular, we have an ecosystem which is of such a scale and of such a complexity that when you try to insert a new piece of technology, there are a lot of things that are happening that can actually affect the outcome, the success of that technology. And understanding if, when, how these things happen is probably just as important uh, as the technology itself, right? And, uh, and I'll try to illustrate this, A, by, you know, showing what can happen, you know, if you don't necessarily take this into account, and then a few examples of the kind of things that we can try to start doing if we want to develop a better understanding. So very quickly, uh, and that's a, a, a really quick one, uh, I mean, the net of it is that the internet is big, right? It, 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 it grew and it continues to grow. Uh, uh, there was, in few areas, a little bit of a slowdown uh, on the traffic side, right, which is, I think, you know, uh, the last piece, right, we've heard actually several recent sort of uh, uh, forecasts that, that are indicating that with all the mobile traffic, video traffic, we're about to actually have another inflection point. So the net is that it's a huge system, right, and any piece of technology is something that has to get adopted, inserted in this huge ecosystem with lots of players, the users, the content providers, the router providers, and so on, the, the server providers, and there are a lot of interactions that, need, that can actually affect how things are evolving. So let me try to first sort of, you know, if not convince you, at least give an example of, of an instance of technology where I think the technology is perfectly fine, but uh, uh, getting it adopted, getting it through, uh, uh, has been nothing but easy, and, and it, we are still not there, right? And that technology is IPv6. Uh, now, for those of you, and hopefully you're all familiar with this, right? So we've had a long expected problem, which is the, one of the main resources that you need to connect to the internet, which is an address, right? Uh, we didn't think that, you know, it was a resource that everyone thought was plentiful, except that we understood it was finite, and any finite resource, you eventually run out of it, and we recently did, right? So the INA gave out the last slash eight, which is the big blog, uh, about a, year, a little bit over a year ago, and all the regional uh, internet registries that are the one that are giving out addresses to you know, the uh, uh, local users in the different regions of the world uh, are in different state of running out of these, right? Now, as I said, this is not new. We, we knew this was coming, right? Actually, 15 years ago, people said, yeah, it's coming. Let's come up with a solution. It was standardized 15 years ago. We've been talking about the you know, impending doom many, many, many times, and maybe a little bit too many times. Right? But it, you know, the technology that essentially implemented or dealt with that sort of new way of identifying devices on the internet through a different address, which has a different format, which is bigger, Right, so that we don't run into that particular issue of running out. Again, uh, uh, that technology is now pretty stable. It's there in pretty much any operating system, any router. Uh, there's obviously legacy devices that don't necessarily have it, but for the past five years, right, I mean, it, it, it's been there. Right? And so from a technology standpoint, it solves the problem. It's mature. It's been tested. And so it should be relatively straightforward. Well, you know, if you actually look and this is a picture, so three years ago, we started trying to figure out, you know, where do we stand? And, with the, with, you know, so there are many different ways of looking at that particular question. The one that we looked at, it says, pick a website, you have an IPv6 address, nothing else, what can you reach? Well, not very much, right? So by, you know, beginning of or middle of 2009, it was below 0.2%. Now, when, whoops, sorry. When we ran out of IP addresses, or INA ran out of IP address, there was a 
little dip. But I mean, again, you know, if you look at where that is, it's still not very far. The big dip here was IPv6 or World IPv6 Day, which was held by some of the biggest you know, uh, uh, companies in the internet, Google, Facebook, and many ISPs participated in that. And you know, basically, they turned IPv6 on and pretty much wanted to say, look, everything works fine. And it did. But even then, right, barely we broke the 1% mark. And many of the people who signed up you know, signed off. Now, yesterday, I don't know if many of you are following that, we had IPv6 World Lounge, right? Which is, and if you go on their website, it sort of says, we now live in a new world, or everything is different. Well, it's not, right? So there was actually a little blip, which since this slide was made a couple of days ago, is not there. We are at about 0.75%. So I mean, the net of it is that we've had this technology. There's a need, right? So we've run out of IPv4 address. It's stable. It's there. And basically, if you look at at least this particular metric, it's still not there, and we need it now, right? So there are really there are questions, there are issues. Why did that happen? How did that happen? And the more problematic thing, or another more problematic thing, is that the people who should be the one pushing for that technology, right, the ISPs, are really not, at least many of them, are not necessarily at the forefront of putting it out, right? So if you look at the number of autonomous systems, there are about 40,000 of them. They're not all service providers, but they, they represent the domains in the internet, right? And you look at different metrics, how many routes do they advertise, how many of them have turned IPv6 on, it's, you know, it's nowhere near what you would like to see because these are the people who should be essentially moving this whole thing forward and migrating us to an IPv6 internet. So it, they're not there. So you could ask and you could argue that, well, you know, the technology is not there yet. Right? You're telling us that the technology is mature, but no, it is not. And that is why people are not jumping on that bandwagon and are not adopting the technology. So that, what I would like to now next convince you of is that, no, that's not true. Right? The technology is indeed there. And there are other things at play that are preventing that technology from making it. So what we've tried to do is assess to what extent the IPv6 technology is indeed mature, and therefore, we have to point the finger to some other reason for the fact that, you know, really we are nowhere near what we were expecting to be at in terms of an adoption of this new technology that's critical to the continued growth of the, uh, the internet, right? And so if you look at the people who are pushing, right, I mean, Google is Facebook, I mean, all the, the people who'd like to sign up new users for which you need new addresses are really eager to see that happen. But we're not there yet. And so what we did is that we were trying to figure out is that, you know, is there a technology component that you can blame, right? And therefore, there is a technology reason for why, you know, we have not moved forward at the speed at which we should be moving forward. So we set up to deploy a couple of different measurement points. And I'll, I'll go pretty quickly through these things because, I mean, what matters is the outcome. And I've already given you the punchline. It's not the technology. It is something else, right? And so I just want to make sure that you don't think that these are empty words and that there's at least some truth behind uh, what I'm telling you. Right? So we've been measuring from various places across the world. Essentially, the same thing is what, it, what is it that you can reach with IPv6? And is there a difference if you can get to it in IPv6 and get to it in IPv4? Because if there is a difference, Right? And that difference can be then traced back to a technology issue. Then the fact that it's not being adopted is a very rational outcome. Right? You can't blame people for not picking up something that doesn't work very well. <coughs> so we have several vantage points. We monitor 1 million and more different sort of possible destination. Out of those 1 million or more, as we were seeing before, a few of them uh, are accessible over both v6 and v4. And we've been running measurements for several months and then essentially gathering all of that data, cleaning it up, right, and trying to essentially then analyze the data that we were getting to understand if there are, are there differences. And if there are differences, where do they come from? Right. So just to sort of uh, give you a sense, right, I mean, we are seeing not the entire internet. 
And that's actually expected, right? So the number of autonomous system that we have here is in the thousands, right? So these are the domains that we are touching. We're traversing them or we are, you know, end system and servers that are located in them. Uh, and so we're clearly not sampling the entire internet, but we knew that at the beginning, at the onset, right? And so uh, um, I don't want to claim that we've looked at the entire internet. We've looked at everything that you can get to with IPv6, and as of today, it is still a relatively small fraction. So that's the outcome. And it's not very good, right? It, it basically, the blue is v6 is better. The red is they're more or less on par. And the, depending on what color this is, green or yellow, right, uh, it's IPv4 is better, right? And so roughly 40% of the time, you're better off not turning IPv6 on, right? Because, you know, if your customers, most of the time, they, if they have a choice, many operating systems are configured that you end up picking IPv6. And so, you know, if IPv4 is better most of the time, right, or at least a significant portion of the time, that could be, you know, sufficient reason for not adopting it. And if that, that's technology driven, then, you know, we are at fault. The technology is at fault, is responsible for its lack of adoption. So what can make things happen? So there are multiple pieces in this end-to-end -end equation, right, from the client all the way to the server, the access network. But what we're really interested in is this middle piece, the guy who are there, the control plane. And what I'll end up sort of hopefully convincing you of is that, you know, the reason we see difference is because of these guys. The rest, I mean, yeah, they are, they are bad clients. Yes, they are bad servers, right? But by and large, the biggest contributor is, is not the technology, is the decisions that people have made, right, on how to use that technology. And so we can't really blame the technology. Okay, so the way we've gone at it is, is pretty straightforward. We essentially try to rule out instances of the technology being the culprit by looking at or by comparing sort of things where we knew that the technology and the network was mostly the same, right? So basically it means picking same starting point, same end point, and making sure that you go from the starting point to the end point the same way whether you use IPv6 and IPv4, right? And so if you actually look at this subset, right, then what you see is a very different outcome, right? Uh, most of the time you either are similar performance, or there's actually what I call zero mode. It means that there's actually a whole bunch of websites in that autonomous system for which the performance of v6 and v4 is the same. There's some others that are worse in v6, right? But the network is the piece that's common. If the network was really bad, everybody would be affected, right? So by and large, right, if you look at apples and apples, namely, Everybody is using IPv6, and we're doing the same thing in IPv6 and IPv4. Most of the time, you don't see much of a performance difference. If, however, you look at, well, this is actually just a, a confirmation that we ran during the, this period of one or two days, uh, IPv6 World Day, where actually there was a much smaller set of, subs, of sites where there was actually the traffic was much higher, right? Because you could argue that, well, you, there's not much IPv6 traffic. That's why you don't see much of a difference. Here, there was actually a significant level of IPv6 traffic, and most of the same findings sort of hold, except that it's now on a much smaller set of sites. If you look now at people where essentially the network has decided because lots of people in the network haven't turned IPv6 on, they've not been motivated to turn IPv6 on, and so if you go from point A to point B over IPv6, you have to take a detour. Then you see worse performance, right? So that, that the bulk of the issues is essentially created by the fact that the people who should be using IPv6 have not been adopting it and are forcing you to take those detours. The technology is not the thing that is creating the problem. So the technology is not creating the problem, right? So the people who are adopting or not adopting that technology are the ones that are actually forcing you to take those detours that are resulting in the worst performance. Why is it that they're not turning IPv6 on? Now, there are many different reasons, right? and I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, the, the point is really that there are multiple players. I mentioned some of them before. The service providers, right, the people who run the network, 
the content providers, the people who run the website and, and offer content, and the users, right? And they, you know, they all, the, the users derive value from the network because they can access the content. The content providers derive value from the users who come and click on the website and generate revenue, and, you know, but they need the network in order to get there. So all these people are interacting with each other and are influencing the decision that each one is making in terms of technology choices, what's good, what's not good, right? And, you know, these interactions are essentially, in some sense, why we are where, where we are, right? So if you look at just a, one, one simple example, if, if I'm a service provider and I give you just an IPv6 address, you will not pay me for that. Why? Because you can't get to less than 1% of the internet. So I have to do something else. I have to have some translation device, right? Now, if this translation device is great, but right, it's very high quality, then the content provider have no incentive to migrate to IPv6. So you're sort of stuck in this limbo, right? And so, but if the quality is bad, then the user are unhappy, right? And maybe the content providers are also unhappy. So there are lots of things that are at play and interacting with each other that are, in the sense, affecting why we are where we are today, which is with much less IPv6 adoption than what we had expected to have. So the net is, and I think that's what I'll spend a little bit of time, is that you know, when you deal with a system of the scale of the internet, right, something where you have lots and lots and lots of devices interacting, multiple players, and they all want something from each other, and their decisions are interdependent, there are things that are going to be affecting which technology succeed, how a particular, a particular piece of technology succeeds, and it's important important to try to understand those interactions whenever you deal with any kind of new technology. So I'll try to give a few examples of the kind of things that one can do, right? the kind of both models and, and insight that, that is available uh, uh, in, in towards understanding those kinds of problems in, in the next few slides. So uh, um, I'll, I'll use actually three examples to do that. One of them is the first one is actually uh, um, you know, when John was talking about ad hoc network, or not ad hoc network, but, but sort of the haggle model where people move and exchange information and pass information, you could actually cast uh, uh, what he was talking about a little bit in, the, in the, the same setting. So the setting that I was looking at is a setting where essentially the users connect to the network, but there is some kind of implicit agreement between either the users or the users in the network that they can each use each other's sort of facility, right? So the standard example that I have here is, you know, Bob, which is in Philadelphia, travels to Paris and is able to connect to the internet using Jane's internet connection in Paris, and inter Jane is able to do the same thing when she's in Philadelphia, right? So actually, you know, a, a company like Phone, which was sort of started in Spain, had a very similar type of model. You were signing up, you would get a Fonera, which was this router, but one of the options of whenever you were getting such a phone era was that you, know, you could connect to the internet through anyone else's phone era, provided that you allowed people to connect through your own. Right? In, in the US recently, cable companies announced that, that you know, Comcast, Time Warner, and the likes, which all run their own little hotspot, are now going to allow each other's users to connect through other people's uh, 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 hotspots. So in, in the Haggle example, right, I mean, you know, people are carrying packets for other people, provided that these other people are going to be carrying their own packet. Right? So what's common in these is that they're actually externalities, right, which is essentially a, it's a fancy word for interactions between the value of the service and uh, uh, the number of users and what users are actually signed up for the service. Right? If I'm the first user to sign up, say in the case of phone, right, or even in the case of a, of a DTN or a Haggle type of system, there's nobody else that I can tap into in order to either carry my packets or when I'm on the road, traveling somewhere else, connect through that other person's device. So there's no utility, there's no benefit to me in that service. But now if you have like 5 million users worldwide, if I sign up, I now have access, in the case of a phone, right, to 5 million access point that I can now connect through, right, if I'm on the road and happen to be in a location where there is one of them, right? So they are, there's a, a change in the utility of the service that happens with 
the adoption of that service. There's the flip side of that, is that if there are more people, well, more people could mean more congestion when I'm going to be trying to access the internet through somebody else's uh, device. If I'm in the Haggle environment, it could be I have to carry more packet, I have to devote more storage to people. So you're going to have positive and negative externalities that are going to be interacting with each other. So how do you try to get a, a handle, how to try to understand what's going on? I mean, there are a whole bunch of different models, right? Uh, 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 and, and most of them are based on what I was referring to in, a minute ago, this notion of utility. Right? So the utility is a way of trying to measure you know, what benefits do people derive from adopting the service. Right? And if the utility is positive, it means they derive a benefit from adopting the service, then they adopt. If the utility is negative, then they don't adopt. And it's just that, those, that utility evolves. It's not a fixed quantity. Right, it changes as different people or more people adopt the service. Right? And so the, the key is to develop a model that capture all these interactions, the effects of these different utilities. So I have very few, I, I, I'll make the, I won't repeat David's joke because I do have a few equations, but they're really not equation. They're just sort of a shorthand for some of the concepts. So, you know, the standard, you, you write sort of the utility of a user. That utility is a function of the user characteristics because you don't want all the users to be identical. That's obviously not a very realistic model. So there's going to be some parameter that captures the user's features, characteristics, and then there are going to be the different components of that utility. In this particular case, there is, oops, in this particular case, there's a component that measures the benefits that they derive, which could be a function of both them, their own characteristics and how many other people have adopted the service. And there's a component that represents the negative part, which could be the congestion created by all these others, and then usually a price, right? And so now you have set up that particular model. Oops. And you know, this is sort of a, a simplified version of it, which uses the essentially linear utilities. So in, in, in practice, what you have to do is, or in, it, for the sake of analysis, you typically solve these systems assuming linear functions because that's where the analysis can carry through. And then you have to test the robustness of the results uh, numerically for other more complicated function. And if you can show that, that you know, more or less the insight and the results hold, then, then you're reasonably in good shape, right? And so now, the way you solve these things is, again, pretty standard. Uh, uh, it's, it's an, I mean, you, you solve either difference equations or differential equations, depending on whether you prefer discrete time or, or continuous time models. And you can characterize the dynamics of adoption. You can characterize equilibria, which are going to be fixed points of the equations that the, you know, character, capture how the utility of a particular user varies as a function of how many users are, are, are uh, adopting, and then you can end up with, in this particular case, you know, fixed points, or you could have equilibria, which are the boundary, which is you know, no, no one adopts, everybody adopts, or at some equilibria, the number of people who adopt essentially are such that you are essentially at the, at the fixed point of some function that characterizes user utility. So why, why is that useful? Why it's useful? Because once you have that framework in place, right, uh, uh, you can actually derive some insight from what's going on, right? And so, for example, you can characterize what kind of possible outcomes do I have, right? And there are different types of systems, and in the system that I'm talking about where you have these negative and positive uh, uh, externalities that are competing with each other, right? The outcomes actually can be, you know, classified depending on, on the parameters or the weight of the different parameters. Uh, but the more interesting thing is that you can actually identify regions, right? And so regions basically says if you're within this range of parameters where, you know, the plus side and the minus sides are within this relative range, right, then this is the kind of outcome that you can have. And, and uh, let me give you two simple examples of what that helps you understand. So uh, once you have that kind of, of you know, results or this kind of regions available to you. Right? So the first one is, so in the, in the system that I was talking about, right? so let's again take the, 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 the phone, F-O-N uh, uh, example, where you had people who would sign up for the service and they could either, when they sign up, 
have a reciprocation agreement, namely they can connect to other people's devices whenever they are roaming, or they could have incentives, namely if you let you know, a certain amount of traffic from other users come through your gateway, you'll be getting compensated in a f function that's proportional to how many of them connect through you, right? At equilibria, these two things actually are, are equivalent in terms of pricing, right? So if you know that at, at equilibria, there's a certain number of people who are going to be coming through your gateway, then that's the same kind of, of outcome than if the service that you're buying was cheaper, right? So there's a, a trade-off, right? There's sort of an equivalence between selling the service for a certain price versus selling the service for a higher price, but then giving people a rebate when they allow others to come and use their devices, right? So it looks very, you know, you could do either or, right? But you can actually see when you look at sort of the outcome that the model helps you uh, extract, right, that these two things can in some cases lead to very different results, right? And, and the reason is, and I'm not going to go into the details, but these boundaries, right, so essentially when you add incentive or when you migrate from high price plus rebate versus low price, no rebate, you're essentially moving in these re regions. And you can actually enter a, a, a different region, which is what this red arrow identifies, where you go from a system where the adoption would actually evolve and converge to an equilibrium where lots of people have adopted to a, an environment where there can actually be multiple equilibria. One of them being actually a low adoption equilibria where therefore you would get stuck at that low adoption equilibria because you've priced the service too high not enough people are joining so that the service is not becoming valuable enough for many of the other people to jump on the bandwagon. Right? And so these insights, right, I mean, if you don't try to capture the essence of the interactions that are going on, it's very hard to extract those kinds of insights. The other insight is that, you know, the standard thing that you want to do when you deploy a service is try to find the best price for that service, the thing that optimizes your revenue, right? And so sometimes it's better to have few people joining if you can charge them more, right, than having lots of people joining, but you have to charge a very low price because what matters in the end is, you know, the total revenue or profit that you're deriving, which is really the product of the number of people joining and the price, right? And so, you know, the standard things that you like to do is figure out, okay, what's the best price that I can set? for my service so as to optimize things, right? And actually, with those models in place, you can go ahead and run that machinery, right? Again, as I mentioned earlier, you have to test these things for robustness, right? Because they, they should not be an artifact of some of the model's assumption. But the, the result, sort of, it, at least the, the one that I'm showing here, sort of actually are reasonably robust. And the thing that you find out is that this is a really tricky system to optimize for price because the optimization is extremely fragile. Right? And, and the reason is, again, something you can trace back to those regions, it's because the optimal point ends up being at those boundaries, right? right there. And so if you make a little bit of an error in your estimation of the system parameter, and these system parameters are things that you know, people who do marketing research can estimate, but they're only estimate, right? They're not exact quantities, and so errors are part of the game. And that's basically telling you if you make a little bit of an error and you know, you've not been very conservative, you fall off that cliff. And so you end up in an environment where rather than high profit and high adoption, you have very low profit, very low adoption. Right? And understanding that you know, the outcome, and this particular service because of the interactions between the positive and negative externalities actually ends up in those kinds of environment is not something, again, that is completely obvious unless you work out those kinds of details. Okay, so the next uh, system that I wanted to talk about uh, um, is, is one which is a little bit different, right? <clears throat> which we've actually, you know, we can connect um, to you know, a couple of the things that we've heard so far, right? So, you know, you can argue that, so if I look at the internet today, right, it's carrying all kind of services, right? Voice, video, audio, data, I mean, Take whatever it is, right? It's the common de facto in communication platform for pretty much everything we do, 
right? And so this is an instance of what I call a shared network, right? So the network, you have one common, in, you have one common platform, and the network is used by all these different services. Now, <coughs> the cloud is, for example, another example uh, is, you know, of, of those kinds of things, where you have this common infrastructure, and with virtualization and other kind of technology, you can make it accessible. Uh, uh, and Scott was taking of the, talking about the benefits of statistical multiplexing. So in general, these shared infrastructure derive a lot of their benefits because you can reuse, you can share, and you can take advantage of statistical multiplexing in them. But that's not always true. Right? So there are instances where having separate dedicated infrastructure for a particular service may actually be better, more cost effective. I mean, why? It's because we have both economies of scope and scale, as well as diseconomies of scope. Right? If I put a new service that multiply, in order to support that service, the cost of my boxes by a factor of 10 or 100, that now needs to be borne by all the other service, then maybe the answer is not having a shared network. You know, if you want to do remote surgery over the internet, I probably don't want to be the patient. But, and, and the network probably would have to be used or upgraded in a way that is somewhat different from what we're capable of doing today. Right? And there are lots of instances or examples in today's environment, like so uh, uh, OT, which is uh, you know, operational, uh, uh, the, the integration of operational and, and information technology. So do I put all the communication between my smart building sensors and my standard IT communication over the same infrastructure, or do I have two separate networks? You see actually people doing both, right? There's some people who have decided that they need two completely separate networks for security, reliability, and whatever. Other people that say, no, no, no. The cost advantages of putting everything onto the same platform is the right way to go. So, you know, it's, it's not an instance where it's obvious which one of these two things is, is better. Why? Because, again, there are different there are interactions that make understanding what's going on and how each parameter influences the outcome somewhat complicated. And so you can actually, again, develop certain models, right, that are going to try to capture the, the, you know, the interactions. And one of the models that I, I just wanted to quickly mention is, is one that we've been playing with, which, again, has these two separate networks. So you can have economies of scope, economies of scale, this economies of scope. So it's, you, know, you can parameterize any way you want. And you can also have, which is to capture the, the, this sort of benefit that, that shared infrastructure have, the ability to reprovision your infrastructure if the demand that you suddenly are getting is different than what you had expected, what you had pre-provisioned your infrastructure for, right? And so then you can now ask under in the, those models, what, uh, when is one option, namely a shared network, better than two separate networks, uh, 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 you know, because it gives me a better price or a better revenue model? And so the models that are available, I mean, if you go to you know, the manufacturing literature or uh, many others, there are sort of many models that are, are, are available. There's some of the, the most useful ones are these sequential decision process where you identify a set of stages that says, okay, I pick you know, this network option, then I provision it for an expected demand because I don't know what the demand is going to be, and then I actually, once the demand is realized, I allocate it in order to optimize the outcome, and then you solve this whole thing. In, in the reverse process, right? Now, what insight does it give you? It actually gives you some reasonably interesting things, right? And in particular, you can actually see that in some cases, right, to what extent, so when you, when you reprovision, namely there's a demand that is more or less than what you had expected, right, you can adjust the capacity, right? But you may not always be able to adjust it instantaneously, so as a result, you may lose some of that demand, or because you have to buy things on the quote-unquote spot market, that reprovisioning may be more expensive, right? and so uh, 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 you know, depending on how good your reprovisioning technology is, right, uh, uh, which option is actually better can change. Right? And so this is, again, not something that's obvious up front. Right? So why is it, right, and how is it that the ability to dynamically capture demand that you had not fully anticipated when you had provisioned for optimal uh, 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 um, revenue, right, 
that can actually affect the outcome. And so how it affects it depends on the other parameters, right? The, the, the relative weight of the economies and this economy of the scope, right? But the interesting thing is that just, you know, if your technology is extremely flexible versus not very flexible in terms of reallocating or allocating new resources, that can change the outcome. Now, the last example that I want to go over is another one that I think we've, 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 we, we can relate to in, in the context of the internet, right? Which is, should we have a smart network or a dumb network, right? So it's a question that, you know, uh, 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 has been asked many times and very often in the context of, you know, positioning the internet versus the bellhead network, right? So, you know, the benefits of the dumb network have sort of really uh, have been sort of highlighted in, in many forums, right? And then people sort of, uh, and obviously you can't disagree with the success of, you know, sort of the, the, the internet architecture, whether it's <clears throat> fully attributable to, um, you know, the <clears throat> quote unquote dumb network paradigm uh, is less clear, right? And so you could ask the question, right? <clears throat> You know, when is a dumb network the right answer versus when is a smart network the, the right answer? So a dumb network, right, is very cheap. Uh, but it means that if people who want more, you know, need more, then they have to spend to implement whatever else they need on top of that base infrastructure. The smart network basically says, no, you know, I'm going to be more expensive, but you don't have to spend that money. You can use it directly. And so when is which option better? I mean, can we develop some understanding or at least initial understanding of those things? Right? So I'm not going to give you an answer because I don't have an answer. Uh, um, the models that you can use for this <coughs> are, are, again, you know, there are a variety of ways you can look at it. A standard, I mean, a, a pretty interesting or useful way is uh, one of, uh, um, that comes from the literature on two-sided market where the network is the platform, you have people providing services on that platform, you have users who are consuming those services, and the platform is the thing that's connect them. And so now the question is if the platform is functionally very rich, the people who develop the services can tap into that richness and don't do much, right? And, but it's more expensive. Right? And so, and, and, but, you know, how many users, how many services are there is the thing that's going to be affecting the utility of the overall system. And so again, all these things are interacting. Right? And so which is better? And the answer is it's really tricky. Right? I mean, you, know, you, can, you can change the answer from one to the other right, very, very easily. Right? And so you could argue that this is an artifact of your modeling and so on. I mean, maybe. Right? I'm, I'm not arguing that this is the perfect model, right? But the, the net of it is that you can really swing things from one place to the other through some really very minor changes in the relative weight of the different parameters. Right? So this is an instance where you know the model gives you some insight, and that insight is a little bit limited because it's sort of right now is telling us that it's really hard. We don't necessarily, you know, it's very hard to get the right answer. But at least, you know, we have made some progress in understanding this. So just to wrap it up, right, so again, I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm not claiming that we should not be working on new technology. I'm just saying that there are other things, given this sort of huge and complex with in environment with so many different interactions that are controlling what happens and what gets adopted, right, uh, it's now equally important whenever you are looking at deploying, you know, sort of promoting a new technology to try to get a handle on not just what that technology is good at, but how the process of getting it adopted within that ecosystem is actually going to happen. And, and if you don't understand that, then, you know, you could run into the exact same problem that IPv6 did, which is, 15 years after recognizing the problem, having a solution that's technology very mature, right, be still below 1% adoption, right, after, again, 15 years. Okay, and I will stop here. <clears throat>